So I just had the most hilarious interaction. I had to step out for a moment, go to Publix and come back. And when I was on my way back in, I uh, saw a black woman at the elevator and I had to pass her uh, to get to the door I needed to go in. So I did what any Southerner would do. When you see another black person, I smiled and I said, how you doing? And <laughs> any Southerner, probably some of the lower Midwestern states, tell me what you say in response. There are several responses that are on code, right? So I'll tell you all the story because it just happened and it's so relevant. Um, one way to know that someone is not from this area um, or they haven't been here long, meaning the South, is that they instead, when you say, how, how you doing? They say, hi. <laughs> and that's how you know. They ain't on code. They, they ain't assimilated to the culture just yet. But anyways, hey there good people. Welcome back to On Code with me, a love for me. Okay, guys, I'm filming this one bent over because I just filmed a uh, Instagram reel slash TikTok of the same outfit because it came to me and it was like, yes, this is it. Love this. I actually already wore this um, to a girl's dinner, like a little catch up. My friend got engaged, so we went and celebrated her. Um, and so I know this works. I got so many compliments. The men were drooling. But regardless of that, a sweater dress is classic. You can find a sweater dress most places. That's why I love it. That's why it's a good option, right? Um, it doesn't have to be this one. Now, I love this one. My mom bought me this one for Christmas. It was on my Pinterest wish list because I'm a type A plus. But I love this because of the fabric. It's a nice thick fabric. It's not made cheaply um, and it's not too tight. I love about sweater dresses is that they're not typically bodycon. They just have good shape. So you're looking for one that has you know, the right darting for your body. My friend was actually wearing a sweater dress. She doesn't have an hourglass like me. She's more of a pear shape. So hers had more like a cowl neck situation and it was shorter than mine. So it fit her body type. So that's the beauty thing about a sweater dress. It doesn't have to be this one, right? Don't go for trying to make your body do something it doesn't do. Fit the body you have. The magic behind a sweater dress is the shapewear. I'm wearing a shapewear under this. I think I took a little video of it. That leaves my bra out, but it has, it goes all the way down to my mid thigh. I have another pair that I wore the first time I wore this um, that is, comes up to the waist and is long, right? And I love these for different things, especially under pants, like slacks and stuff, um, especially in the winter, because it takes away all of the look of your undergarments, right? And that's what makes this so put together, right? It could be sexy, it could just be classy and elegant, right? Mine's more sexy. My friend was wearing one that was more elegant, and it's how you style around it that makes it great. Um, another option, depending on your shape, this one I like. It comes from under the boob to cover the butt. Um, and so it also lifts. So if you need some butt lift, if you don't have like much butt tissue, <laughs> this will give you some lift to give you, uh, like accentuate the shape you have, right? Or if you have a mommy pouch, this is probably a good way to go. If you have like a lot of back fat, this is a good way to go. And this just makes it so it's the silhouette people see and not your undergarments. You don't have to be worried about your undergarments. That's the beauty of shapewear for me. I'm not trying to create shape I don't have. I'm also wearing boots. Just wear it with a clutch or some kind of evening bag, but you get the picture here. A sweater dress is the perfect thing. And yeah, I just wanted to show you guys an option for Valentine's Day, for Valentine's Day, or just cause you wanna look cute. Cause that's what I be doing. I just step lightly, stunting on these hoes because I can. So it's time to bust out this bad boy here and I'm excited to open this. I bought this for myself at the end of the year. It's from an Australian company, T2, and I haven't bought from them because I didn't know the quality of their tea and I didn't want to have to um, pay import nothing. <laughs> but they have a tea tin here for every month of the year. And today I'm going to try the January tea. It's a quiet mind, a flavored herbal tisane in a bag. These are all sachets. So I'm gonna brew this in a sachet, but like, isn't that gorgeous? Beautiful. And we're gonna see how this one tastes. And it already smells delightful. So that tells you that it's probably a good quality of tea because I could smell it the moment I open the thing. 
um, and it's, you could see like a bunch of uh, tea leaves and stuff. So it's not tea dust. Chow, I can't. <laughs> I'll take that on the road. I will not take that at home. Anyways, let me brew this tea and it'll be time to chat about something else that came to me. Something else I want for us this year that I think is going to be important to our overall mental health. It tastes good yet, but it certainly smells good. That was like a honey laden spoonful. But anyways, this is not an ad. I'm just telling y'all what I did. Oh, it's a little fruity, a little minty. It smells so good. Okay, I see, I see. Uh-huh. I'm gonna let it keep steeping while we chat and I'll try it again when we're done. Okay, so in episode one, we talked about my approach to the year what I'm hoping for. And I think it resonated with a good number of you all. I think another thing that's not an approach, but a rule for this year, especially considering the political climate we're going to be in, we're already in, is take what you need and leave the rest. That's my plan. When we go to the grocery store, we need to take what we need and leave the rest. And that's especially important, okay? I'm telling myself this, okay? Because I will be leaving with like two sorbets. <laughs> I just did this, okay? And something else. And that was never on the list, right? There are days that I intentionally buy extra, right? That have things in the budget, but like health-wise, financially, I need to take what I need from the grocery store and leave the rest. And after reading and putting into practice some of the real self-care principles I learned last year, I think it's the key to being okay mentally in this new world that's a lot more chaotic than it used to be, right? In this new world where money is a real problem, not just something in the back of your mind, but like a problem in front of your face, as Americans, but because of inflation, it's always like present, right? So basically whatever you can do to find peace, to have some kind of quiet is the idea here. This is what I'm hoping for us, right? So especially in this political climate, right? Where I just watched a video, well not just, by Olay, which I don't know how to say her real name, um, it was like a three hour video on voting. I mean, I'm gonna vote, most black women vote, um, and then the black men who do vote, vote the same way we do typically. But there's gonna be a lot of noise. Every election cycle, they try to blame black people for everything. Um, they try to say we don't vote or we vote this way or that. When the, the stats show, we vote, and we pretty much vote along the same lines. Um, what you see on TikTok right now is a little disconcerting, right? I'm seeing people say like they're happy, they want Trump back because he gave us money. And I'm like, is that how we're really feeling? I don't know. That tells me I need to get into my community, right? Um, and see what people really are thinking, not what the internet is telling me. I need to go and do the real work and leave everything else behind, right? I don't need to take what the internet is saying. I need to go and see what people are saying in my community where I live. Not CNN, not, hopefully God, you don't watch Fox, <laughs> not NPR, none of that. I need to go and see what's happening where I live. I need to take what's important and leave the rest. I think this is so prescient when it comes to these podcasts as a single woman, as a woman. <laughs> the last year, actually since the panoramic, the podcasts, the podcasts have been telling black women that we need to not be single, but we do need to be single, that we need to have gentle parenting, but also beat our kids, that we need to be partnered, but only with the right person at the right time, that we need to be a community, but like only within these boundaries, that we are all trash and our younger generation is trash. Like that's what all these podcasts are saying. It's terrible. And I'm just ready to leave them behind. There are a few I love. I love, love, love listening to I Will Teach You To Be Rich, mainly because it's not all that. It's real life people. You get to see how they're living, how they're making all this work. And I take what I need to from that and I leave anything I don't 
need. Now, I learned a lot in that podcast about how we, as people, screw ourselves over financially. So that's, if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. But I saw Olay's video and I was like, sis, you're speaking to me. You're speaking my language. We need to take what we need and leave the rest behind. I mean, it, skinny is in. And I have identified that I want to get in really good shape, right? And many of you have said the same, right? You want to, you have like a health goal for the year. And I think it's more important than ever that we take what we need and leave the rest. Because when skinny is in, diet culture is at its worst. We've seen it before. If you're new to this, um, you haven't. But if you have been around for a bit, we've seen skinny before. If you were a curvy person, um, if you are a genetically bigger person, just leave it. Leave all of it, okay? Um, do what we know is generally accepted practice, right? Take that and leave the rest. We all know that some kind of fitness, some kind of exercise is important to our overall health, right? Take that. Leave the ones that tell you you have to do Pilates, <laughs> tell you you have to walk every day. Leave all that. Just do what works for you with an accepted practice and leave the rest. There, are, The way I eat, I eat in a way that suits my lifestyle, suits my budget, right? I need you to do the same. We need to be on one accord here. This is even more important, I think, when it comes to relationships, right? Oh, one thing 2020 taught me is that the people who are here for you will be here for you. They will stand 10 toes down for you. People who want to be in your life and who mean you good will reach out to you, right? They will show that they want you in community with them. Don't go picking up that ex that checks back on you every two months. Let me tell you how my long-term ex, my long-term relationship checks on me at least every six months. And what is he doing? He's just trying to see whether he's gotten in, right? I broke up with that man years ago now and I ain't going back. Look, don't go back, okay? Take the people who you know love you, want to be around you, make you feel good, right? Never stick with the people who make you feel terrible. I think sometimes we do that. Sometimes I know I do that where... It's not even that they make me feel terrible. I just feel like I would be a terrible person if I abandoned this person. But if this person is making me feel less than my best self on a regular basis, I need to leave that person in, in the dust. I need to take the people who add to my life and leave the rest behind, right? That's healthy. That's smart. <laughs> That's what I need to do. Even I did a clothing purge. I showed you guys. I took what I know will fit and I sold the rest, okay? Another one that I really want us to think about because I'm seeing it more and more is naturals wearing their hair straight. I said it before, if you wanna do that, do that. I typically do this to trim my hair and that is what I did and to take advantage of being able to wear my hair straight for like a week or two while I'm not exercising so hard. I like having that option, that's for me. Do whatever you want to do with your hair and leave everybody else <laughs> out of it. Like, there, like there's such wars right now going on about being straight and natural, about being relaxed. Look, do you. Do you. The name of the game for 2024 is take what you need and leave the rest. Now, I'm hoping you take this. <laughs> I hope this becomes something you need. This chatting situation here, I love talking to y'all. Uh, but if you don't need it, leave it. Okay, leave it, especially with social media. I don't know if you've ever noticed before, but pay attention. If you get on social media and your whole entire mood changes, and by the time you get off, you're exhausted, you probably should get off of social media a bit. The worst relationship you can have with social media is that it causes you to be on an emotional roller coaster, right? It's a bunch of people you don't really know <laughs> and you can't have conversations with a lot of people because a lot of people are just addicted to outrage and saying you know, crazy things and things like that. Instead, get off of social media. Go talk to people in re real life. Uh, I don't, like, read a book, okay? Whatever you do, don't let social media be the thing that determines how your day begins runs and ends, okay? In 2024, we are taking what we need and we're leaving the rest. Now, the question is, do I need this tea? 
<laughs> oh, yeah. I just needed to let it steep a little longer. I'm getting more of the fruity notes. I like this. I like this a lot. Actually, I'm really prioritizing work-life harmony. And I'm doing that in two very particular ways. Actually, probably three. One, I'm focused on rest. And so already in Q1, at the beginning of the quarter, I scheduled my days off. And I encourage you to do that as well. Second, I'm indulging in hobbies. I spent all of last year figuring out adult hobbies, which sounds funny, sounds weird, but I realized I really didn't have hobbies in place. I took up creating creative journaling, which I'm really enjoying. Um, I got back into playing my flute. Um, I read. So I just like really figured out hobbies that I can do every single week and find pleasure, play, curiosity, enjoy it within. And then last but not least, I created a 24 and 2024 bucket list for this year. First time I've ever done it. And it's all around adventure and play. Two things that I value in my life. So this one, I found a great fuss spot. That was like my priority to find the best one in Atlanta. And then two, I did a movie day, which I haven't done since undergrad. I spent a whole day watching movies from the moment I decided to get out of the bed to the evening, like till I went to sleep. I did it on Saturday. I watched X-Men movies all day. I ordered a pizza small. I ordered wings and fries. I went and bought popcorn. I bought soda <laughs> and candy. And I did just like a full ping out movie day. And that's the kind of work-life harmony I'm shooting for. In the comments, let me know what's your hobby. Do you have hobbies? We'd really like to know. I promise you we need to know because when I was trying to figure out my hobbies, I actually had to Google adult hobbies. Hey, welcome back to my kitchen. I think we got better lighting this time and better sound, hopefully. <laughs> you can always see my microphone. If you're wondering what this is, this is the microphone. But I decided that I was gonna make pot roast. I think it was last week. It might've been the week before. I think it was last week. And um, when you're single, <laughs> getting a piece of meat for a pot roast or what we're going to cook today that is not huge is impossible. It's just not possible. Now, in public, they probably cut it down for me, but what I learned to do is make half of it. So I find the smallest one I can, which is usually between two and three pounds uh, typically, and then I cut it in half and I freeze half of it. And this will make me typically, if what I'm eating, between two and three meals that way. Um, the pot roast I didn't make just for myself, and so there was no leftovers <laughs> um, because it was good, okay? Simple food is wonderful. Stews in the winter are wonderful, and it has been cold as all get out. But as a result, I'm craving stews, right? Like hearty stews, and so, what I'm doing today is making one of my favorites. So we're gonna start by seasoning the meat because I want it to sit with the seasoning for at least 15 to 20 minutes to get up to room temperature because I'm gonna sear it off. So the seasoning I like to use, even on pot roast, no matter what I'm doing, um, typically if I have a piece of chuck, which is what this is, chuck, um, it's a big size piece of chuck, but it's still small enough to go in my slow cooker. What I like to put on it simply is carne asada seasoning. I've never used the Lowry's brand before until the last time. I usually go with Noor as my, see, I, I don't know why, I think childhood, <laughs> like Sasson from Noor, uh, Sasson uh, uh, Duete, like, I don't know, I, this could be a Florida influence. Y'all tell me, <laughs> but like I, my bouillon, all of that comes from Noor. Uh, and so this is the first time I've seen a Lowry's version but there's usually just like meat seasoning, like that's what it is. But this is just a mixture of seasonings that are good with meat, like salt and cumin and oregano and stuff like that, right? This is all I'm gonna put on there to start. I'm just gonna cover it generously though. Like cover your meat generously. Now, typically with this particular recipe, they tell you to cube the meat, but that just takes longer to sear and is unnecessary because I'm gonna cook it until the meat falls off the bone. So that's already one substitution I typically make um, for this. But like I said, season the meat generously because this is where your salt is gonna come from. Um, it cooks for hours. And so doing that later isn't ideal. You wanna do it now because chuck is a thick piece of meat. Cover all sides. And then you just set that aside 
while you get everything else prepped. And by the time you're done prepping everything else, which this isn't, this doesn't take a lot of prep, your meat is up at room temperature and you're ready to move on to actually doing something with it. I want one of those wood cutting boards, one of the good ones, but I have yet to justify buying it because I have two plastic cutting boards, one I use for meat and one I use for veggies. Somehow I know the difference, I don't know. <laughs> um, but then if I got one of those like really good wood, wood cutting boards, I think the brand is like Boone or something like that, it starts with a B, then I had to put it somewhere. I had to store it too. So it like, it's like, is it worth it? Do any of you have like a really good wood cutting board? And what is your preference? Like, tell me, is it is it worth getting or is it just beautifully aesthetic? Which I'm not opposed to, but like, is it worth it? So I love this crock pot because it's another one of those things. Typically it's all about the big slow cooker, right? You're cooking for like five or more people, four or more people. But I don't think I should be left out of it if I'm just cooking for one or two people. Like I also <laughs> want easy meals that don't have a lot of cleanup. So I'm going to turn my slow cooker on to low and I just go ahead and turn it on. You don't have to wait until you put things in it because it takes a moment to warm up, right? Like I just turned it on and I'm holding the inside because it takes a minute to warm up. One key to making this a beautifully easy meal, slow cooker liners. No one likes insane cleanup, no one. I like to be done with my food at the end of the day and then I'm just able to chill, right? I could take the plastic bag out, gently wash the slow cooker, not have to do too much and then boom, you're good. And honestly, whether I have slow cooker liners or turkey bags, it don't matter, these bags are the same. Um, you just want it to be able to fit in your slow cooker and the shape is the only difference, right? So when I'm doing my crab bags, I like the turkey size shape. And when I'm doing the slow cooker, either can go because neither bag is made for these like three quart <laughs> slow cooker. So like I said, I'm just gonna set that aside because it's not warm yet and it's gonna take 15, maybe 20 to 30 minutes to warm up. So now, go ahead and chop the veggies I'm gonna use. Okay, you see my backlights are on because we're about to hit, hit the stove. Um, but first I put all of my stalks of thyme in there because the meat is gonna go on top of it. This is fresh thyme. I use like four stalks, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, I'll leave a link to this recipe, but I do things a little differently, so I'm sharing what I do. So I put that in there and I rinsed and basically cleaned my celery um, to make sure that there's no dirt on it. I find like even when you buy it in the store, cleaned, um, rent, you know, they say wash three times or whatever. It's celery is still one of those that will be dirty when you open it. And then I cut it into these chunks, right? They're not small. Um, I did the same for my onion. So I used a small onion and I have some mushrooms. Now I had leftover shiitakes, so I'm using them but I would typically use a Bella, like a baby Bella, um, or white button mushroom. So let's hit the stove and sear our meat. It's going to sear for like three to four minutes on each side. Don't put the heat too high. You don't have to smoke up the kitchen. You wanna start on a higher heat because the meat is not as warm as the heat on the stove, right? So you want it to be somewhat smoky, like the oil is very thin, basically. Then you put it in there and I immediately turn it down to closer to medium. You don't have to burn up your house <laughs> to sear meat, okay? Um, and then you just sear each side. So sear every side and then throw it in the slow cooker. Okay, so hopefully you can see what I did. I did a voiceover, I think, but hopefully you can see what I did as well. The garlic, I really just left in there quickly. I was looking to see it start to brown. Everybody says 30 seconds, but don't go by that. Look at when it's gonna start to brown. And now it's pretty much ready to go in the slow cooker. I just put liquid in there to get the brown bits. You would typically use wine and render that wine down for a couple minutes. Um, like five minutes for the alcohol to cook off and that would pick up the bits at the bottom of the pan But you're really building flavor here and my mouth is watering <laughs> because it's time for lunch, but um it's, I wanted this to go on in at noon So it would be ready around six 
But now I'm gonna go ahead and throw these in. I didn't cook the onions to the point where they were like super translucent. To me, that's not necessarily, I just wanted a bit of browning, a bit of caramelization. Um, the mushrooms as well, you just wanna soak up a bit of the juices and just start with the celery. And now I throw it all in the slow cooker on top of my meat. You can see the steam now. And that's the beautiful piece of meat <laughs> that's in there. See how seared that completely, right? Now we just add this on top. And then you just wanna add enough broth to cover the meat. It's going to produce more liquid. And when I add the barley, I might end up with more um, liquid in there. The barley is gonna thicken this too. Um, so you don't need to go overboard with the liquid. Now we're gonna cook this for four hours on low before I add the next step. It's lunchtime though, and you notice this doesn't really have any vegetables. <laughs> So it is imperative that I eat a salad for lunch because it's gonna have all of the vegetables I wanna eat today. So I'm gonna get that going and enjoy lunch because my mouth is salivating. I am hungry. Okay, so about four hours into the cook time, I rinsed and added some barley. Um, it was a, half, a third of a cup. Um, and I also added bay leaves earlier. I just forgot to say that. I use a third of a cup uh, because I have the recipe. Okay, I actually already did this once, but I'll show you again. <laughs> I wasn't recording. All right, so what you're looking for here is for the meat to fall apart naturally. You see that? Yeah, it's falling apart. The barley, as you can see, has plumped up. And I'm just gonna take all these little thyme twigs out so I don't actually accidentally eat them. If you're serving someone else, be sure to take those out. Um, and other than that, I'm just gonna dish this up. It is a complete meal. Um, you can add a roll to it. If I had a roll, I would do that, but I'm just gonna toast a piece of bread because I ain't got no rolls. <laughs> and I didn't wanna buy any just for this. I didn't have another meal, so let me dish it Anyone up. Anyone else toast their bread in the air fryer? I don't have a toaster. <laughs> um, I have never bought one because I just always put it in the oven. A toaster seems very like singular. There's not a lot of stuff I toast, so it's like, there's no need to buy a toaster. I'd rather just put stuff in the oven when I need to toast. But ever since I got an air fryer, I toast my bread there. Do you see how beautiful it is? If I flipped it, it would look even on both sides, but like either way, it's crunchy and delightful. Every single time I do this with anything that I need to toast. It could be waffles, frozen waffles. It could be French toast is frozen, Trader Joe's brioche French toast. Um, I just throw it in the air fryer and it works out beautifully. Mmm, mmm, yeah. No. If anything, no. So, oh, the crunch, and then I'm just gonna eat, and I'll see y'all <laughs> soon. So, I put them all in here, not a whole lot of products, and then a couple of books, two books. So, let's just dig them out. First and foremost, Olaplex. This bomb maintenance shampoo surprised me. Um, these days, I don't feel like there's a lot of new stuff and this isn't new but it is a return to the old in a good way so y'all know i love the easy on the curl shampoo from the main choice and then they changed it and it's still good but it's not what it originally was and this is what it originally was i could use that every week because it made my hair feel so hydrated there wasn't a shampoo like it and even in their own line, there wasn't a shampoo like it. And then this came out and Olaplex sent this to me for free. And I was like, I'll try it. I figured it would be more stripping, but it's actually really, really hydrating. I can use this weekly and it would be fine. It's more cleansing than hydrating or moisturizing. Like, you don't, it doesn't have as much of the oil slippiness, but it is as hydrating as the main choice. And I like that. I don't need a bunch of oils in my cleanser. I don't need a bunch of silicones. This doesn't have all that. Um, it has some. It does have polymers, has extracts, but in the end, it's just a really, really good shampoo. Um, I have been thinking like, if I could only use certain products, what would I use, right? And this is one of them. I use my Oyen um, Ginger Mate Co-Wash the other week. I used the very last of it I had up. And I was like, dang, if I could only use three cleansers, 
that would be one of them. I've used it the whole time I was doing wash and goes, probably summer, uh, spring, summer, and then the rest of the year I would use this. And then if I was using silicones or like quarterly, I would cleanse with the Kiki Curly Come Clean. But that's me getting on my list. But anyways, this staple, love it. Another thing in the way of skincare, you see how <laughs> like this is almost gone. It's like all the way down here. This is a CeraVe Hydrating Cream to Foam Cleanser. This is Welcome back to my closet. <laughs> I think we did a name for this section. Like, what do we call this section? Me in the closet with the microphone. Y'all know how I call the trade a trade. I feel like it's that kind of vibe, right? I'm in the closet. I don't want to use an R. Kelly reference because that's just not okay. And I'm making light because this next topic is not light. But I think it's important for many reasons. But I think we consistently talk about representation on this space and, you know, throughout the internet. But we don't talk about the cost behind being an only. Um, we don't talk about the cost of being a high-powered Black woman in the workplace. Actually, don't even have to be high-powered. There's just an inherent cost, mentally and emotionally, sometimes physically, the higher you get in the workplace. It doesn't matter where, right? Um, I've experienced this as an executive, as well as an entry-level person in nonprofits, in a corporate space, um, in like just retail business space, you know, people who want to challenge you because you're a black woman in the workplace. But lack, let's back up. Hey, it's funny. I'm often asked to talk about natural hair in the workplace, right? Um, our parents is a big thing in the workplace. If I were to have straight hair all the time, I understand the circle that I would move in. I do. But I also have the natural hair aesthetic, which is very much in line with the arts which I work in. It actually is a class moniker, right? Um, but also, our hair can be weaponized against us, right? With the wigs and the weaves and the braids. Those are seen as very black hairstyles, right? Um, whereas locks is very much in the line of the academic. Our appearance alone is polarizing in the workplace. So it's not surprising when they experience our minimal brain power and wisdom, they feel threatened and our existence is then challenged. I'm bringing this up because of two particular black women and their very public cases um, in the news. One, Dr. Claudine Gay of Harvard. She became the president and, and had to step down not far after. Um, and then in a much more tragic case at Lincoln University, Candia Bailey, also known as Bonnie, um, took her own life. I do want to talk about this common phenomena and how if you are not in community with a lot of black women, you are often out on an island unprepared for what it is to be a black woman in the workplace, especially the higher you get. And you could think it's just you. You could believe that you are the issue and there's not a whole system reinforcing what happened to these women. So if you don't know, Dr. Claudine Gay was the president of Harvard University. And after a probe in which she was asked about anti-Semitism on the Harvard campus, that led to a series of attacks um, in which she was charged with plagiarism anti-Semitism and several other things by basically right-wing zealots, alumni, but people with an agenda against diversity, equity, and inclusion as a whole, as a concept. And it was very public. The, the main perpetrator behind this campaign against her had a whole article um, which I'll leave below. I found it very difficult to read, to be honest. It's very triggering. If you've had like at least 10 years of experience in the workplace, I don't care your age, it's probably going to be a bit triggering because the way this person lays out their campaign of attack, they're gleeful about it. You know, they're gleeful about causing this black woman pain. And it's very clear that though there are people who were like, this is wrong, there was not enough community and support around her to have a different outcome. And Dr. Gay was very, very qualified. 
Um, now, we'll talk about that in a moment because in, in some ways, socially, it's hard for her to be as qualified as past presidents. We'll talk about that. Um, but she was dean at Harvard. Um, she had published at Harvard. She'd been a professor for several years. She had done the work and had the natural progression towards presidency. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Bonnie. And I call her Bonnie because that's what everything I read. It was a, a, a term of endearment, that nickname. And so I want to give her that respect so she's no longer with us. Bonnie was also a university alum and vice president, I think, of um, student affairs. But big difference. She was in community. She was at an HBCU, Lincoln University. There's more than Lincoln University in the Midwest. So I want to make that clear. Um, but she was in community. However, her boss, the president of the university, was a white man. That makes a difference. I'll talk about that. But I just want to point out that there have been several HBCU black women presidents and many of them have been pushed out as well. So it's not a white institution versus black institution thing. It is a systemic thing. It's a thing in which if you are not aware of the spaces in which you can succeed, you will become representation in a space that only causes you harm. And the real question is, is it worth that? And that's when it becomes clear that representation is not okay at all costs. So a few of the common things that were here, um, something that I and many black women face in the workplace is gaslighting. We experience this in the world, right? But, you know, in situations like these, people who are like, yes, we're ready for you, especially concerning DEI, IDEA, actually, um, when we are asked to come in uh, and we're supported by this board that has brought us in, a lot of the times there's gaslighting involved because a lot of the times this board knows, yeah, half the board may be ready, not the whole board, right? Or the board may be ready, but no one's the institution may not be ready for the change they're seeking from this black person, right? This happens all the time. It's a particularly insidious level of gaslighting that we face. I've personally said this several times in my own field, and I think one of the important things for us to remember is that we cannot save people who do not want to be saved. And we have to do our full due diligence when it comes to going into spaces with the idea of diversifying. Because in the end, if you don't have support on multiple levels, you cannot succeed in these hostile spaces. The gaslighting is real. I'm sure the intention was probably good but in practice you can't forget we live in america where these systems are large and in charge and the gaslighting in the case of dr gay is even more insidious because if you look at who's on the board of the harvard corporation which is one of the oldest corporations it might be the, uh, the largest the oldest corporation in the u.s um it is run by old money and real power, right? Past presidents of Harvard have a similar look, similar social standing, similar class. So when I think of a black president of Harvard, it makes sense for it to be someone who has a, a similar circle, right? There are black people like this. Now, black people in America generally don't have the wealth of the real wealthy families in America, right? That generally comes from slave wealth. But there are black people who run in those circles who understand the politics of it all um, and understand that it's not just about having the academic credentials. And that's who would actually be successful in a position like that. Someone who knows what's coming at them, knows the deals they're gonna have to make. That person would be successful. It is gaslighting to tell someone that, oh yeah, you have all the credentials. I think you'd be great in this DEI space when they know that they don't have the same circles. This person doesn't have the same circles and they're not setting them up with the necessary community for them to succeed, right? In the HBCU space, if you read the articles, I can't say what's true, what's not true completely. Um, but 
Bonnie had reported what she was experiencing. Um, and there was a lot of gaslighting in that situation. And in what has been reported, it is clear that she was made to feel like these things weren't happening, right? Gaslighting at the base level. Then we have sabotage, which is another common thing for Black women in the workplace. And it happens from many angles. I mean, and I know in academia, a lot of my Black woman professor friends get the worst level of sabotage from Black men. There's a level of um, fear involved there, a fear of the challenge. Also by other people of other cultures who want the labor and they want the credit but they feel intimidated by this black woman because typically this black woman has a lot of knowledge. I don't care what level you're at, right? You could be at the retail level. You can experience sabotage at every level. And if you're not aware that this is possible, you will think that you are the problem. But this is part of a system that is meant to keep you from advancing. You know, one of my favorite short story collections is The uh, Secret Life of Church Ladies. And it has this story where this black man is in academia. He has all of these, this anxiety and he's sabotaging this black woman. Um, and it was just like, wow, I don't know who she knows, but I've heard this story. And I just, if you've never heard, read the secret life church ladies, I do encourage you to do that uh, audiobook actually, because it was really good that way. Um, it's fiction, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you have no idea how someone could sabotage someone else, in academia, I think it's a, it's a good primer for that. Dr. Gay got in the position and was charged and challenged with plagiarism um, that was years old. And if you know anything about academia, if you study at the graduate level, you know that if Dr. Gay published something, many people checked for plagiarism. And it happens. Sometimes you don't cite sources, right? You've been, there's like 50 sources in one thing. This is not uncommon. There can be 50 sources in one thing. You'll see all the time in published journals where there is a correction or, or anything really in a published journal. In all these years, this kind of situation that they're calling plagiarism is not uncommon and not unknown, right? But the way it was used was intentional sabotage. And it was allowed to happen because this black woman is in a precarious situation. We get into a precarious situation oftentimes when we get to these executive position. Bonnie also experienced sabotage when she reported something. Instead of getting the investigation she expected, um, in, in which at least some of her experiences would be validated. Instead, she received reports basically saying she's terrible, right? None of this really happened. The gaslighting, right? She was being terrorized according to her. I, like I said, I can't verify what was true and what wasn't true. Um, but I'm always going to believe a black woman. I'm <laughs> fight somebody else. Um, but she was being terrorized at work by her boss. And she went through the proper channels and received backlash. And that's something black women in the workplace have to think about. So let's actually talk about a few things that I've learned from older black women. And that's another conversation we're going to have next time about the workplace. Some just good practice. First and foremost, keep a paper trail of everything. Every interaction that's not positive you need to write down the date, the time, and what happened and keep any kind of paper trail you can have. Um, also, before you go to HR, really think about the fact that HR is there to protect the company, not necessarily you. Um, and I'm not saying everyone is like this, but that's basically the point of it. And it's not always a safe space to air out your grievances. I think the biggest message here, and this is something I've been talking about with my friends recently, is that you got to know when to bow out. You got to know when to move on. Black women are being charged with saving the world. We cannot take on that moniker. We cannot do that for our own health. The community is not there to support us in the workplace, typically. I'm not saying don't go for the top. I'm not saying don't do what your heart desires. I'm saying be aware of the systems we live in. Be aware who is actually in community with you 
And even though, <laughs> and, and always remember, like your mama said, not everyone is your little friend. Get what you need from it. It could be fulfilling. My job is very fulfilling. I love what I do. I love who I support with what I do. But I'm also aware that I don't own the company and that I could do the same thing somewhere else. Um, and there may come a point where I do need to do the same thing somewhere else. And that is okay. Let's remember that work is a means to life and you can enjoy it and not enjoy it, but it doesn't need to be everything to the point where you get to this point that I'm talking about, right? Where you get to the point where you feel you can't share any of what you're feeling with other people, where you feel like this has broken you completely, where you're not in community enough with people in the space you want to go in to get the real tea. See, that's one of the biggest reasons to be in network with your people. Because as you climb, they'll tell you the real deal about these institutions, about these organizations and these corporations. So that if you do decide to step into that higher power role, make that money and create change you want to create, you know what barriers you're going to face. You have the community to hold you up when things get tough. And I want us to remember that representation at all costs is not the goal. It's not. We live in a system as Black women, and I want us to thrive as much as we can. So whether you're starting your business and you say, hey, I'm going to take this route because I don't want none of this, you will face this system along the way. So I need us to choose us, okay? We don't need to save the world from itself. It does not benefit us. You know, I feel like there's been a lot of uh, backlash toward feminism uh, in these last several years with the rise of men's fear for all that's worth, uh, whatever. But I do want us to put our energy where it is best served. And sometimes that's in the workplace and a lot of time that's not. So as we know, my main goal here is to empower us as a community. And I don't want us to skip over what has happened with these two women without acknowledging and learning from their experiences. So do the research, please do the reading on these two particular situations. And definitely, if you have something to add, write it in the comments below, because I have learned so much from other black women in the workplace. I would not be where I am. I would not have the survival mechanisms that I have if it wasn't for other black women. I do want to be clear. I'm not saying this and studying this to be discouraging. I am saying this and I am studying this because I want us to not gaslight ourselves. Hey there, good people. Welcome to the Love for Books podcast. And today I want to talk to you about how I got out of a multi-year reading slump. So first let's talk about how I got into it. See, the pandemic happened, right? 2020 happened to us all in the world. And at first I was reading more because we I had nothing else to do, <laughs> right? Um, and it was good to me. It kept me engaged. It, came, it gave me something to escape into, gave me something to talk to uh, others about. Uh, and then in 2021, I went back to work and I think it was so jarring for me that I really kind of just went to the brass tacks, down to the brass tacks, right? Having to deal with the mental issues that came from isolation and then going back and being six feet apart from everybody, all the precautions. It was a lot for me, I think, mentally and emotionally. And I just stepped away from everything except the essentials. And each year, 21, 22, 23, I set a reading goal and I tried I tried but my brain just wasn't finding solace in reading anymore and then I think about mid 2023 I was like you know I have to figure this out I have all these unread books my physical TBR is large I was still buying books and not reading them because I was trying and overall I knew I wanted to get back to it because prior to 2020 reading was some of the places that I found the most joy, the most creativity, and it's part of what I do for a living, is writing a lot. Reading helps me remain creative. 
And so I really wanted to get back into it as a regular practice. So in 2023, I tried things and this is what worked. First and foremost, I returned to the two genres that I can read really fast and interest me and make me want to keep reading. You would think that I'm radiating because I'm really happy and I am because I love this new format and I love the response to the first video so I really appreciate you all, especially my subscribers because so many of the views were from subscribers and that rarely happens. Like 80 odd percent were from subscribers according to YouTube and I love that for us. But I do want to add, because I've already edited like the first insert, the style insert. I want to reiterate that the shapewear is for the silhouette. I'm not making any commentary on anyone's body. Do you, you don't have to wear shapewear if you don't want to. It's just inexpensive shapewear that I really wanted to share because I see a lot of expensive shapewear being shared, but in my experience, the inexpensive stuff works just as well. I do have some really expensive shapewear as well. And depending on what I'm doing, like if I'm going to, uh, a, an evening event at the Kennedy Center. I generally wear the more expensive shapewear under my evening gowns, but just for everyday life, it's the less expensive shapewear and that works for me. So I wanted to share it. Also to give you an update on the previous press-ons because these are my new ones. I love these press-ons. They're really cute. Again, by OPI. I bought two, if y'all remember, um, two pairs by OPI at the same time. And that nail glue kept my nails on for two and a half weeks through two washings of my hair. And this one was longer because I straightened my hair. So those nails got heat and everything. I mean, that's pretty remarkable to me. And I'm definitely gonna keep this energy. I'm gonna try Kiss next. One of you said they have like a wider nail bed. So I do wanna try that next because I do have what I call fat fingers. So I wanna try that next. Like they're short, but the nail beds are kind of wider, if that makes sense. I think it's partially because I used to suck my fingers when I was a kid. Like some people suck their thumb. I suck these two fingers. I didn't even stop till middle school. <laughs> like that's how long it went. And then I substituted that with nail biting. I didn't start nail biting until I stopped sucking my fingers it all correlated, right? Um, and I guess it's how I dealt with like anxiety. So not biting my nails, which I don't do with these, you know, I have to deal with my own anxiety a different way, which is probably healthy. I am in therapy, <laughs> I just like to say that. <laughs> but to head out here, I wanted to say thank you to particular people. Tresses of Alexis, Alexis. I really wanna say thank you for supporting me I know how hard it is as a content creator to transition your content and you're just always there and I appreciate you for that. In my last video, she left like three comments. She knows how much that helps. The more you comment, the more it helps our videos. When you like and comment, it tells the algorithm that you like this and maybe someone else will too. Like in the video content you watch, someone else who watches your content, kind of content may like this video too. And Alexis knows that. So like oh, under all of my videos, she's always commenting. She shows up to the live streams. And when I have a question, cause we have to chat about brands between all of us influencers, um, she doesn't hesitate to answer. I'll be like, how much did you charge for this? And she'll tell me, or I'll be like, yeah, this brand was trash. And she'll talk back, you know? And I really appreciate that. I really do. I also wanted to shout out Karen M. Um, I missed Karen in last week's shout outs. And when Karen commented, I was like, oh my God, should have included Karen. Karen is a long time subscriber. And I just really appreciate all of you who are giving this new format a chance. But also Karen is just always giving me encouragement. And I really appreciate that. I'm actually thinking, and oh, let me continue before I tell you guys the last thing, because I, I have an idea for us to like get together regularly. Um, and I, I want to thank my new patrons because there's been a fair number of new patrons this month. And you know, when you put money into supporting me, that says a lot. I don't take a lot of sponsorships. I haven't um, because I don't want to stifle my own creativity. If they fit, they fit, right? A lot of times, and I'm telling you, brands have been reaching out, either lowballing me, a lot of them, or they have so many rules around the content, and I'm only gonna share what I actually use, what I actually recommend. I just have integrity, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and so it's been really cathartic this last year to not take any sponsorships, if you didn't notice, I didn't take any, and to just gain, regain my love for creating the way I wanna create. 
and I think moving forward, hopefully I'm thinking that we can continue in this vein. And when I do get sponsorships, I will be taking them this year. They are not too intrusive. That's my hope. Y'all let me know in the comments what you think about these formats. Like, am I too close? Like, let me know if I'm too close in any of the clips. Let me know what you think about the sound. I think all the sound worked out this time. <laughs> my light just went out, so maybe not the lighting, but let me know what you think of the sound. Last but not least, I'm thinking if you guys are game in, I'm start, I'm thinking March, like once the cold is over, that we do like a monthly walk on the belt line, right? I'm thinking we like start it just had honey and get some tea, right? And then we just walk on the belt line for like 45 minutes and we just chat it up and we just have a little community. Um, and the people who are in Atlanta, near Atlanta, if you're visiting, let me know. And that way I could schedule it when you're visiting, right? Um, but I just want us to be able to get together as the community and chat it up, support each other. I think as we're moving into a more volatile political climate, I think it's important for people who I don't know for us to have a discussion too. And like I said, I'm all about community and I've been trying to figure out how we can meet. I didn't want to do, if you know Atlanta restaurants, this is why I've never done a meetup at a restaurant <laughs> because the only restaurants that I can count on are the ones that are um, expensive and midtown and out, right? So like Decatur, Marietta, every, everywhere except downtown Atlanta. <laughs> And there are some soulful restaurants in South Side of Atlanta that I love, but they don't have the space, like the capacity to handle if I just told a bunch of people to show up. And I don't think it'll be a lot of people, don't get me wrong, but like, I finally figured it out. <laughs> I was watching uh, Bajanista on um, and then the financial diet. And I was like, oh yeah, we could just meet on the belt line. That's a place everybody knows. We can meet at Just Dad Honey and just walk the belt line. There's plenty of space, right, to walk the belt line and go from there. So let me know what you think of that. I want to start it in March. If you're visiting Atlanta in March, let me know so that I can schedule it then. I will have to, of course, schedule it around my <laughs> own schedule, but like, let me know, is a weekday better, weekend better? And if we do this, how do we coordinate it? I really, I need your help, okay? <laughs> I don't know everything. I need your help. So thank you so much for joining me and stay tuned for another episode of Uncode with me.